This is the black hole that keeps on giving. It certainly is, yes. What's the latest news? Yeah, so you may remember there was the first ever picture of a black hole uh, came out in, well, almost two years ago now. The Event Horizon Telescope folk have been beavering away, actually with the same data, to ex extract even more information from it. And the results of that just came out, just published in Astrophysical Journal Letters a couple of days ago. It, it's one of the most massive black holes we know about. So it's about a billion times the mass of the sun. A really, really massive black hole in the middle of Messier 87 in the Virgo cluster. And it turns out, even though it's not the closest one we could be looking at, it's it's because it's so massive, its influence is over a, as, as large a region as any other. And so actually it's a really good one to look at because it's, you know, it's a very massive black hole, which means its event horizon is big, which means that even though it's a reasonable distance away, the telescope can still resolve what's going on. And it seems we've gone from blurry orangeness to swirling orangeness. <laughs> well, the, the, so the swirliness is... A, a, a little bit of a trick in that it's really just a way of visualising what's going on. Let me show you what they actually measured, which doesn't look anywhere near as pretty. So here's what they actually measured. And it's basically, instead of just measuring the brightness of this ring of light around the black hole, they're measuring this effect called polarisation. Light is made up of an electric field and a magnetic field. And if you just think about the electric field for a moment, it's oscillating away. That's what a, an electromagnetic wave is. It's an oscillation of that electric and magnetic field. But of course, it could oscillate up and down or left and right. And so the polarisation is basically telling you what direction the light's oscillating in. And that's essentially what they measured in this picture, is that they basically measured that where not only can they tell you how bright the light is from every point in, in the surroundings of this black hole, but they can tell you what direction it's polarised in as well. I guess the first thing to say is, is it's, it's a complete tour de force of actually extracting this information. Right? Just making the picture at all was an amazing thing to do. But now they've gone beyond that to actually extract this polarisation information. And remember, they were combining radio telescopes all around the world and correlating all that data together to, to produce this amazing image. And then once they've done all that, now they've got, kind of gone back and done it all again. But, but not only are they now measuring the light, but they're actually telling us about the way that that, that light is polarised. And that involves combining the polarisation information that they've again received from all these individual uh, radio dishes all around the world. So just getting a measurement of the effect at all is an amazing thing to do. But now that they've measured it, they can actually start learning something about the process of accretion onto the black hole. The big part of the reason why we're interested and why particularly we're interested in polarisation is because we know that Messier 87, this galaxy, produces a, a jet flying out from the centre, which is clearly associated with the black, this black hole. It's a phenomenon we've seen in lots of other galaxies. I think M87 was the first galaxy it was ever actually seen in, in about 1918. So it's a bit of a phenomenon that's been known about for a, a very long time. But we think that the process of shooting that jet out is something to do with the magnetic fields, that the magnetic fields are getting all tangled and twisted up. That twisting of the magnetic field lines is what's accelerating the particles out to produce this jet. OK, now, the nice thing is that the emission that you see uh, where there are magnetic fields is this thing called synchrotron emission, where you've got uh, electrons whizzing around the magnetic field lines. That uh, emission is polarised. And so this detection of polarisation is telling us something about the magnetic field structure around the black hole, because the fact that it's polarised is almost certainly associated with synchrotron emission. And the direction of the polarisation is telling us something about the magnetic fields, and the strength of the polarisation is telling us something about the magnetic fields too. Is the magnetic field that appears to be around this black hole at M87 exactly what we would have expected? Has this confirmed what the theorists said, or has it thrown any curveballs at us? Uh, a bit of both, actually. I mean, the fact that it's there at all is good news. There are two things. For, so the, the, the two things that kind of come out from this. So there, were, there are actually two papers. There's a paper of the observations and there's a paper of the theory. And the kind of the things that fed into the theory paper from the observation paper are firstly the directions of the polarisation, which is kind of in this sort of... They're sort of the, the polarisation is kind of oriented around the image rather than radial inwards or radial outwards. It's kind of curling around the image. And the second is the strength of the, of the polarisation. So let's start with the strength of the polarisation. It's not actually that strongly polarised, right? If you look at the scale here, the, the colours here are telling you the strength of the polarisation, and it's like point, you know, so they're sort of bluish in colour, so it's about a tenth polarised. The thing about synchrotron radiation is it's incredibly strongly polarised. It should be, you know, sort of 70, 80 percent polarised, and we're only seeing 10 percent polarisation. Probably what's going on there is there's another piece of physics, a thing called Faraday rotation, which is that when polarised light 
passes through a plasma and a magnetic field, its polarization gets rotated around. And so what we think is happening here is that there's kind of a quite a complicated mess of magnetic fields and, and plasma between us and where the stuff is being emitted. And that is sort of messing up the polarization. So even if the stuff were very strongly polarized when it was first produced, some of it gets rotated a bit, some of it gets rotated the other way, some of it doesn't get rotated at all. So the net effect of that is that we lose a lot of that polarization information. So this is telling us straight away the strength of the of the polarization or the relative actually weakness of the polarization is telling us that there's a lot going on that we haven't yet resolved that's kind of within what we can see. And the net effect of that is that we don't see so much polarization. So that's the first half of the story. Um, the second half of the story, I guess we need to switch to the theory paper. And they did a whole a, a, a really long, complicated paper where they described the modeling they've done to try to reproduce the results that they were seeing. But interestingly, the kind of the gist of it comes from one of the first figures in the paper. Um, so this is a figure from the from the theory paper where they look at what would happen, what you'd expect to see if you had a toroidal magnetic field. That's a magnetic field which is kind of going around and around the black hole the same way the material is going around the black hole. Uh, a radial magnetic field. So that's a magnetic field sticking in towards the black hole or radially outwards from the black hole. And a vertical magnetic field, that's one that's sticking up through this disk of material that's orbiting around the black hole. And what you can see is that the one that really doesn't fit at all is the toroidal one, because the toroidal one says the polarization should all be pointing radially inwards or outwards. And yet what we actually saw in the data is that the polarization is actually more or less going around. So that's what you expect from the radial magnetic field or the vertical magnetic field. And the reason why that's interesting is that a toroidal magnetic field is what you'd expect if what was going on is you've got a whole load of material that's orbiting around and it's basically carrying the magnetic field with it. Because if it were carrying the magnetic field with it, that would have the effect of kind of twisting the magnetic field round and around and around and you'd end up with a magnetic field that kind of went round and around the black hole. Okay, and this is saying that's not what's happening, that the, the material can't be carrying the magnetic field with it. The only time that doesn't happen is if the magnetic field is so strong that it actually says, no, I'm not going that way. And so actually it's strong enough to actually resist the, the, the pull of all the material going around with it. Um, and that happens when the magnetic field, so magnetic fields are weird in that they actually act a little bit like a gas. They can kind of exert pressure of their own. So magnetic field lines, for example, if you think about a magnetic field as those kind of magnetic field lines, they don't get it like getting pushed very close together. And so they actually exert a pressure back. And what this is saying is that this magnetic field must be so strong that the pressure terms that just come from the magnetic field in a, uh, itself are strong enough to resist the, the gas and not get carried along with the gas. Um, so that's telling you, it's weird, the, the polarization measurement sort of says, says actually the magnetic fields can't be, the, you know, we're not seeing that much effect of a strong magnetic field because of these weird Faraday rotation effects. But the, this other piece of evidence is saying actually the underlying magnetic field, what's producing it in the first place, is very, very strong. That was a sort of a toy model, just them looking at what they would expect to see qualitatively. In the rest of the paper, they went in on in, in excruciating detail to look at a whole bunch of detailed simulations to see if they did. And you've got to feed in magnetic fields, gas physics and general relativity. So they're incredibly complicated simulations to do. But they basically compared the observations to a whole bunch of these simulations, which sort of confirms that qualitative picture. And the only things that they can get to fit are things that they call MAD disks. And a MAD disk is a magnetically arrested disk. MAD stands for a magnetically arrested disk, which basically means the magnetic field is strong enough to stop the disk in its tracks. And so instead of thinking of the gas just orbiting around, it actually gets pulled to a halt by the magnetic field pressure and will then end up sort of following the magnetic field and falling into the black hole rather than just following a simple orbit around as we'd expect from a simple disk picture. So that classic animation we always see of black holes with a kind of swirling disk around that might not be what they look like at all. Not in this inner parts of the disk. And bear in mind, they really are very close to the event horizon of the black hole. So probably that picture is right on the larger scale that there is indeed material swirling around in something that looks a bit like a disk. This is saying that actually when you get right to that final moment, as stuff is arriving at the black hole, the picture must change and the material probably isn't swirling around, it's being pulled along and along the magnetic field lines rather than going around in nice circular orbits. Professor, what's actually generating the magnetic field at a black hole? Magnetic fields are everywhere, right? And and what probably what's happening is that what's going on around the black hole is just concentrating magnetic fields. As you pull the material in, 
you pull the magnetic fields with it. Remember, when you're not in this situation where the magnetic fields pressure is strong enough to resist this, magnetic fields tend to just follow the material. They get sort of sucked along with it. So as the material gets pulled towards the black hole, it pulls the magnetic field with it. And that sort of concentrates the magnetic field lines. So you start from this very weak magnetic field at large radii, but by the time you're getting closer to the black hole, you can have quite intense magnetic fields. So the black hole itself hasn't got a magnetic field the way that the Earth does or the Sun does and like that. No, and in fact, it fundamentally can't. Because nothing can emerge from a black hole, you can't even have magnetic field lines emerging from the black hole itself. So it's actually not possible for the black hole itself to kind of sprout magnetic field lines. It's a thing called the no hair theorem, right? That you can't actually put hair onto a black hole. And this is the same thing, that you can't have magnetic field lines sprouting out from a black hole. So the magnetic fields are all outside the black hole itself. And Professor, that headline image that we've all seen over the last couple of days, that orangey one with the cool lines coming out of it, you kind of hinted that maybe that sort of is a bit of a fudge, is it, to sort of map the data in a pleasing way? It's a, Exactly. It's a way of visualising. So, as I say, what they actually measured was was this thing with the, with the little lines and so on. What they've come up with is a really nice way of visualising that kind of swirly effect and interpolating between the points where they've got measurements, uh, just to give you a way of kind of visualising the data in a way. And it's not, you know, it's not something that's just been produced for publicity purposes. It's actually when they start trying to compare their models with the data, that visualisation, putting their, their models in the same way, the same kind of visualisation as the data, is a really nice way of qualitatively comparing them and see what matches up and what doesn't. So if I drove out to M87 in my spaceship and parked at a respectable distance, would I see anything like what that picture looks like? I, no, you wouldn't see that swirly picture. Uh, I mean, you, you know, you see some pretty dramatic things, I think, but, uh, and, and you might even see some of the effects of the magnetic field, because just like if you think about those beautiful pictures that you get of the sun, where you see the plasma flowing along the magnetic field lines of the sun, you could well be seeing those kind of phenomena where the plasma around the black hole is flowing along the magnetic fields and really picking them out. So you could actually effectively see the magnetic field lines, but they wouldn't look, I don't think, quite like those visualisations. And lastly, Professor, you indicated that this data is the original data they used before, just analysed in a new way. Why does it take so long? It's because it's a, so you've really got to check every possible, there are lots of possible systematic things that can creep in. There are lots of things that can mess up your data. So they spend a lot of time calibrating the data, making sure they really understood the data, making sure there wasn't anything left in the data that was not associate you know that was not astrophysical but was to do with their telescopes so there's a huge amount of processing and then actually computationally you know just actually analyzing the data producing these maps doing all the simulations it's a huge amount of work so it's taken more or less all this time just to get from the point of producing that first image and even in that first image they knew there was polarization information there but to go from that to actually being able to do something quantitative of saying this is how big the polarisation is, this is how it's oriented, it's a massive work, which is why it's taken quite a while to get here. I know I ask you this all the time, but there's a great big supermassive black hole, presumably, right on our doorstep at the centre of our own Milky Way. Can we just not get yep. a good enough look at it? In fact, so there's, there is, I mean, it's much smaller than the one in the middle of M87. It's in, you know, in the millions of solar masses rather than the billions of solar masses. But, it's, you know, it's a thousand times closer. So actually the scale of things is the same. Interestingly, it's, I think, I mean, and they've, they've been trying to produce a picture of the, of the black hole in the middle of the Milky Way as well with, with the, the Event Horizon Telescope. Um, the reason why it's difficult is this Faraday rotation thing, that actually the, the, maybe the things emitting you know, beautifully polarised light around from around the black hole. But actually, be between us and the centre of the galaxy, there's a whole bunch of magnetic fields associated with the galaxy, which really messes up the, uh, the radio emission. Plus, there's interstellar medium, which causes scintillations. It's just a lot harder to look at our own uh, black hole in the middle of our own galaxy because we're peering through all the things between us and the centre of the galaxy, which just mess up the picture. Whereas M87 is well out of the plane of the galaxy, so there's really not much us between us and M87. And so we get a much clearer view of something which is sort of the same size, at least in terms of angle, which makes it a much easier thing to look at. The black hole onto what we call the accretion disk, which is sort of the bathtub of water that's trying to spiral in, you've almost merged the two plug holes. So you've made the plug hole bigger. So not only have you grown the black hole in that way, you've then almost made it easier for it to accrete more material, right? Because you've made it so that it has a bigger gravitational pull 